translation service is not a commodity, but it's often perceived like that by procurement professionals. You put together captioning, transcription, access services, the market grows a lot as opposed to just core transcription services. It revolves around GDPR, as far as I can tell. So the idea is to try and anonymize data, so get rid of things or replace things like names and credit card numbers and dates with asterisks. And welcome everyone to SlaterPod 75. Hi, Esther. Hello. Summer has begun. Yeah. It's great. In earnest. <laughs> in earnest. Glad summer has begun. I'm still inside at the office, but I should be outside doing other stuff. But here we are, recording a podcast uh, today, a fantastic podcast about procurement, how to uh, manage, crack, maintain, I don't know what the master. word is, but master <laughs> the good a good relationship with the big procurement uh, organizations that are often in charge of buying uh, large um amounts of translation and localization. So today we have Armand Breivig on the podcast, uh, Managing Director at Procurement Cube, a procurement consultancy. So again, it's all about buying translation. How do you work with those big procurement organizations? Super helpful, of course, for anybody who's looking into, you know, breaking into the bigger accounts, maybe the top 1,000 accounts where procurement starts to, to matter. Uh, I, I had uh, in my previous role uh, a lot of exposure to those those types of organizations, big procurement organizations, uh, sh so-called shared services uh, units that, that are buying in bulk literally anything from pencils to, you know, translation. So this will be helpful. Who's buying uh, pencils? <laughs> okay, maybe that's the wrong thing. I don't know. Buying. No, buying, but I get the point. Buying mice. <laughs> staplers. Buying mice. Buying mice. There we go. That's good. So... Uh, today, we're going to talk about RWS's new boss. That was a bit of a surprise. Um, mm. Then Subly, uh, startup in, I think, London, raised a seed yeah. round. And way past seed is Verbit, who raised uh, a Series D. Mm. And we're going to talk about that. And then Python for translators, just a quick excursion into the world of coding. I'm just going to tippy-toe there because, you know, I can't code. So I, I don't want to say any ridiculous stuff there. And then uh, data anonymization in translation, which we covered. So, but the big news this week was really that uh, RWS, what's probably arguably the industry's largest or second largest, depending on how this plays out this year, uh, LSP uh, got a new new CEO. Esther, who, who's yeah. the new CEO? What's his background? And what else is going on over there at RWS? Yeah, it's a gentleman called Ian L. Mokadem, who is joining in July as the new group CEO. Um, so yeah, he replaces the current CEO, which is Richard Thompson, who I think has been with the business in some way, shape or form since around 2012. Um, and then for the past few years as, as CEO. Um, so yeah, Ian is not from the language industry. So he's, he's coming in with a, uh, fresh, fresh set of eyes. Um, but he has this uh, background in consulting in various sort of sectors of business, like energy and shipping. He's held former CEO roles. Um, also, as you'd expect, um, at a business called X over group, which is materials testing business and a shipping company called V group. Um, both of which are now private equity backed. He, Worked for nine years as well in a lead, in leadership roles at uh, Centrica, which is a an energy company based here in the UK. Um, interestingly, at X Over Group, he actually he took the company um, through an IPO, uh, and then a few years later took the company private after mm. uh, multiple acquisitions. So he's got might there, very might, very strong corporate background. Might there be a plot that is thickening a little bit? If he's, uh, you know, a plot is a foot. Yeah, who knows? <laughs> a foot, right? Yeah, no, he definitely is an outsider. I mean, I, it's it's mm. um, when I see someone. I mean, an outsider from the industry. When I see someone who has uh, is third degree connected to me on LinkedIn, yeah. not rare, anymore though. Not anymore. Not anymore. Okay, uh, maybe now it's second. But right after the post, he was third, which means mm. there's zero overlap. Which, yeah, I mean that's that's interesting. I, I probably got about five thousand connections now on LinkedIn, or maybe yeah. four or something like that. So, and probably a good chunk, uh, maybe like 70, 60 percent of those in the, in in the lock industry. Well, welcome, 
Ian, to the translation localization industry. Hope yeah. we get you on the pod at some point in the future or I at uh, one of our conferences. So that would be great. Yeah. Um, he also posted about his appointment on um, on LinkedIn. I think, as you alluded to, um, so shared that he'd be joining um, and lots of lots of comments welcoming welcoming him to the industry as well. So. Yes, we will embrace him with open arms. We'll embrace um, him. Yeah. At the same time, so this this announcement from RWS um, was, I mean, it came at the same time as they released their half year revenues um, to March, the end of March. And that was, um, sorry, just yeah. to jump in there, that was very much in line with what they, yeah, per the previous yeah. trading update, right? Yes, exactly. Okay. So most of the numbers we already knew about um, from the trading update, I think back in March, um, they, so they generated 326.4 million, that's pounds um, in those six months. So roughly um, 460 million US dollars. Um, they shared the pre-tax profits as well, which I think previously they just said would they were expecting to be above 50 million pounds and it came in marginally above that. So again, in line with expectations, um, they, they also did some, a uh, bit more reporting on a divisional level and, um, shared some numbers from Webdunia and Iconic as well, which, um, obviously RWS acquired in 2020. Um, they, so both of those two combined Webdunia and Iconic con contributed 4.4 million GBP over that for a full six months while SDL was only technically part of the group for five months and contributed around 151 million pounds in that time as well so yeah a few other things which we could we can unpack a little bit if you'd like uh, let's let's go to I mean iconic there was another announcement yeah. right uh, so iconic oh, about, the name's gonna mm. the name's gonna go and they're gonna yeah well you tell us about it Oh, but they're bringing back the language Weaver, right? Which I think is now going to be RWS's entire sort of MT offering. So they means? combine Iconic and SDL's MT offering, correct? And make yeah. it language, language Weaver? Yeah. Language Weaver. Language Weaver. So language that, Weaver... But that name was already around, wasn't it? That was their product. Yeah, that shows our relatively young age in the industry. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I, this was before my, like, not LSP time, but before my time as a, a kind of an industry observer. I, a language mm. was, a, was a pure play MT company that SDL acquired back in the day. I think mm. I, I would have to Google, but probably in the early teens, like maybe 10 years ago. Um, and it was, yeah, it was, it was an acquisition by by SDL. So they still own the domain languageweaver.com. I think it's a good move from a branding point of view. I mean, you have two assets here. You have Iconic and, and SDL MT. We, in previous podcasts, we were wondering what they were going to do with the two, right? So because mm. we, actually we were wondering why RWS would acquire Iconic and then like a couple of months later, I uh, acquire SDL, right? Because SDL yeah. has a pretty sizable MT offering. Here we are combining it, Language Weaver. Uh, John Tinsley shared it on um, on LinkedIn, LinkedIn and they posted a couple of PR announcements. Yeah, I've seen a few job job yeah. title updates as well around cool. Language Weaver and things like that as well now. I like it. It's a good name. It's a good name. Good name, good domain. Good mm. luck to them. Uh, more on the startup side, Subly. I like, I like the name, Subly. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on with Subly? Where are they? What it do they do? It's a good name. It's quite, it's quite uh, pleasing to say, isn't it? Like bubbly. Yes. yes. Subbly, so. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is a subtitle uh, SaaS startup uh, that raised $1 million in seed round. So as you said, they are based in London, here in London, uh, sunny London. Um, they are a translation, uh, subtitling and automatic transcription provider. Uh, so they started out i think about an hour, uh, an hour and a half that's too soon a year and yes, a half yes, yeah. <laughs> about a year and a half uh, ago and the founder ceo holly stevens said that she had seen a gap in the market um, as consume as a consumer of online content uh, so she said i experienced you know the problem myself on youtube and then in the same 
problem when she was in internal comms roles she said the issue was we needed to subtitle our videos we needed lots of different languages and, and things like that as well so that was that's the use case um and they have this subscription model that's based on three core services of transcription subtitling and translation they only started making money generating revenues in july of last year so right in the middle of the pandemic it's relatively fresh to to uh, to the game um, to money making <laughs> to money making yes <laughs> All right. and they said yeah. why are you laughing is that a, is that a poor description of uh, of what happened no, i guess they I'm, said I'm they started to, I, generating revenues in july yeah yeah i'm trying to laugh at my own joke so sorry about that <laughs> it's okay if you're funny you're funny um but they said that that basically covid gave them a boost uh, to the business as well because there were more companies that were needing to reach their target audiences from well, remotely from a distance um they during the pandemic so last year they they did re raise as well a small pre-seed round of about uh, 0.3 million dollars and then this seed round uh, which was announced at the end of may so YouTube, YouTube is really their channel that they want to focus on. Interesting. Seems um, so. And, and so much competition in that space. It's just, mm. it seems like a very bold play. But, you know, um, she did manage to convince some investors and that there seems to be some, yeah, some early revenue. Um, just such a competitive space. I mean, you know, we're, we're, I mean, we're basically, we'd be a potential customer right i mean we we yeah. are doing one hour podcasts on a weekly basis we are transcribing and subtitling mm -hmm. them so yeah. we should probably look at subly at some point but we're already using <laughs> the script so you know it's it's a competitive space and mm -hmm. maybe it's more i mean there's this whole wave of like creators i guess they're calling them right creators mm. maybe more younger people that that do i mean they used to be called maybe i don't know youtubers now maybe they're called creators so um influences yeah, in, in, yeah it's different it's maybe more kind of but, the instagram thing yeah oh yeah good point so, yeah that shows what i know about influencing well, what do i know about influencing <laughs> I, I just wait until my kids are grow, uh, grow up a little bit to uh they'll teach to, you. <laughs> you know to to update me on what, what's going on out there uh yeah and also transcription so talking about transcription um mm. at the very uh, tail end of you know startup funding uh, we're finding verbit which yeah. just raised a series d uh, at a massive like 157 million series d uh, which apparently values the company at a cool billion dollars now, which would technically qualify as a unicorn. Mm -hmm. So Verbit is Israel-based transcription, captioning, uh, but Origins in Transcription now does captioning. They acquired a company called VTech, which we covered probably just only a couple of podcasts ago. Um, yeah, and like three, four weeks ago, I think. Three, four weeks ago. So let's not cover that part. Go back and listen to that episode or read up on it. And now, uh, you know, on when it was it two days ago that came out that they raised this massive, massive Series D. They're saying it's a hundred million dollar uh, revenue business, probably ARR. So it's kind of annualized. So you know, when you combine VTech and Verbit together, there's some growth. So yeah, roughly, that's roughly the the ballpark for for revenue. And um, it seems like a massive, massive round. We've never seen anything like that in the translation or localization space. It's like four, mm. uh, two and a half times on bubble, which I think if I remember correctly, still the largest. So there's a lot of confidence in transcription and captioning being a, a large market. But, um, and also just, just briefly going back to the timing, not to speculate too much, but you know, Probably that was more of a, okay, let's get the, the news around the acquisition out and then, you know, basically get the news around the fundraising out instead of, mm. you know, you have two opportunities to, to get some visibility as opposed to putting the, the two together and, uh, and uh, getting only one press release out. Mm. So well, well played uh, media department at Verbit or retained PR, PR agency for Verbit. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. 
And so just, yeah, I mean, it seems massive and we probably have to look into the transcription market more. I mean, we, we, we are covering captioning now with also uh, yeah. AI media in Australia. So I think, you know, you put together captioning, transcription, you access services, you, you get uh, the market growth, uh, grows, grows a lot as opposed to just core, core transcription services. But still, it just mm. seems, seems a massive round. Um, for an industry that I, used to think of very much kind of mom and pop shop um, um, dominated and, and obviously technology is just so big in this space. I mean, like mm. when we're, uh, like w when you speak, then the yeah. script is close to perfect when you speak like very, you know, um, clearly. <laughs> clearly. And of course there's all these um, imperfections in speech and, and I guess that's the, the trick here, but um yeah, yeah. In interesting, interesting round, very, very large. And there was one thing that they mentioned that they, uh, there was a story that said they were going to buy translation companies. To, like in, in the story, it says mm. the Series D uh, would help finance the acquisition of translation companies. But it seems like that might be like a typo or something. Like we, we asked yeah. them about it, but we did not really get yeah. an answer, right? They said, exactly. I, I wanted to know, is this really translation you know what does this mean so i did ask them they said um well they said they see acquisitions as customer acquisitions um and that they plan to double down on that as a strategy and then they did say some industries that they have on their radar is healthcare government insurance but i think as you're saying this is potentially not translation as in lsps as we might understand it yeah. necessarily it could be lumping everything together and calling it translation. Mm. All right, and, and that was not that was not in their press release though. That was in a in a no. in just a media article. So maybe the, yeah. the journalist there just didn't didn't really distinguish between transcription and exactly. translation. Yeah. Happens, happens. Um, so Esther, how are your coding skills? Um, non-existent. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say my coding Nine. skills are about as good as my German. <laughs> But your German is existing. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, uh, both are non-existent. Yeah, no, mine neither. It's um, but I've here. Uh, yeah, why do I ask? I mean, we we wrote an article around uh, translators in Python because there's now a number of degrees um, and advanced studies programs that actually offer basic Python uh, courses. And so I think we, we had the University of Zurich, uh, European Masters in Technology for Translation Interpreting, and then uh, the Middleburg Institute of International Studies. They all offer, um, they all offer this. And so, so this is, this is so interesting because it's such a vast, I mean, this is, this is just a huge step forward to, you know, what we were taught. I mean, or I was taught like back like 15 years ago, I mean, it was super language based handwriting, et cetera. So it was very much kind of the craft of translation and, mm. and now to, to offer Python coding uh, for, for translators is, 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 I think it's fantastic because it, it, you know, you, the, the point would be to, um, that, that a lot of NLP is, is coded in, in Python and, uh, mm. and so you kind of, as as a language person, you probably initial step would be to lose the fear of coding in the first place, and then uh, potentially also you know tinker around with some of these uh, these engines at the end of the day and and write short programs. But again, I I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't know much about it. I think you should look at the article plus head over to those programs. I think it's a it's a nice addition to the curriculum for for translators and 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 maybe even interpreters. So. Good, good to all those, uh, good and all those units that that are offering this. Um, data anonymization. There is a mm. new tool out in. I love that pre-beta. What's pre-beta? Why not call it alpha? Alpha. But <laughs> pre-beta means you post, can access post it. Post alpha, but pre-beta. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what what is Who what knows? is it, and what can you use it for? Yeah. Well, data anonymization. Uh, is the name of the game here. So this was a project known as MAPA uh, that is Multilingual Anonymization Toolkit for Public Administrators. Um, so it's a project that came out of some funding, I think, from um, the European Commission's Innovation and Networks Executive Agency. Lots of acronyms and long, 
long names there. Um, but it's being led by Panjianic, um, the LSP. Um, and they have, yeah, I mean, they've been working on the project for a little while. They're working alongside uh, some different partners as well. Um, like Tilde and then some other um, universities and research centers. Um, but the, the tool itself is using, I think it revolves around GDPR as far as I can tell. So the idea is to try and anonymize data. So get rid of things or replace things like names and credit card numbers and dates with asterisks. So you're not sharing any confidential information or sharing anything that would breach the general data protection regulation in the EU. So to do that, the tool is using named entity recognition to mm -hmm. first ident well, to identify these things and AI processing to identify the, the personal details. It's available in all of the 24 languages of the European Union and it has a focus on the legal and medical domains. So cool. They, they also plan to open source it. So I think at the, at the moment, well, actually, there's a beta version that's going to be released in June. So we're very close to the actual beta version, I, I guess. And then a final toolkit later in the year that will be um, suited for a couple of different use cases. Um, so, yeah, people are going to be able to download the tool. It will have an open source license, added data security, and we'll be able to connect with other kinds of software so that people can actually incorporate it into their own processes um, by building on the code, coming back to coding. <laughs> back to coding. Back mm. to coding, over to procuring. Um, let's head over and talk to Armand about how big procurement organizations buy translation and all kinds of other things. So Sounds good. A couple of seconds. Bye. See ya. And welcome back to SlaterPod today with Armand Breivik, uh, the Managing Director at Procurement Cube. Hi, Armand. Hi. So where in the world does this podcast find you, Armand? Um, well, uh, I am uh, in the UK where I've lived for 22 years now. Um, as, you, as you may already have, have picked up, I do have a bit of an accent. Uh, that's because I uh, actually grew up in Denmark. <clears throat> nice. But I've also lived in, uh, in in Zambia and in Canada before moving to the UK. In Zambia and Canada and now the UK. So yeah, great, good. Twenty two years in the UK. That's uh, good choice. <laughs> good choice. I like good it. choice. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a, it, obviously where about in the UK in in the London area or? No, I am in Nottingham. I used to live uh, very close to London in a place called Brentwood, uh, but moved away from there about uh, well about 19 years ago. So I've been in Nottingham now, which is, uh, for those that are not from the UK, it's right in the center of the, of, of the UK in what's called the Midlands. Got it. Um, so you're leading Procurement Cube, a procurement advisory firm. So just tell us a little bit about your personal professional background, what got you into procurement? Um, yeah, just kind of the, your company and, and the offering in a nutshell. Yeah, I think uh, in terms of what got me into procurement, uh, I kind of fell into the profession. And I think that's typical for, for most procurement professionals. So uh, my educational background is uh, engineering and, and business. Uh, and I, I, I found myself in, in the procurement space where I've been for uh, more than 20 years now. Uh, I have um, worked with a number of big global companies like uh, AstraZeneca, uh, Takeda, Thomson Reuters, uh, and I've also had the privilege of actually working on the sales side. I've working in, been working as a director of sales for a small software as a service company. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 2012, uh, I started uh, Procurement Cube. And uh, I think really what, what sets um, us apart as an agency is that, that we uh, always encourage our clients to see beyond the immediate cost savings. Uh, to um, the much wider business benefits that good procurement can can actually bring about, and I think it's it's that motivation to um, to do that that sort of propelled me into into starting my my own agency. So the the, the business background uh, uh, combined with 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 the procurement experience, I could see there was there was a gap there. A lot of good work being done in procurement, but I think um, that element of of focus on the wider business benefits is sometimes lost. 
Got it. Yeah, that's uh, that's quite the step to you know start your own firm, of course. And so who who works with a professional procurement consultant, like advisory firm firm like yours? Just you mentioned a, a few names, but maybe even if it's a, a on a no name basis, like just outline maybe a couple of client cases. How do they find you? What how do you find them? What's like a, a typical project look like? Well. Um... We've relied a lot on, on personal networks to actually, to actually find, uh, find assignments. It's typically companies that have a unique, um, a requirement, um, to complete a sourcing project or implement category management, for example, but they don't have enough of the in-house expertise or they don't have the in-house expertise at all. Uh, another type of client is, um, uh, maybe a large, a company that has plenty of expertise, but they're just experiencing a temporary uh, resource ga uh, gap that they need that they need filling. Those are those are sort of the most common scenarios, really. So, just briefly, when you made, mentioned resource ga uh, resources gap, so it would be I don't know somebody going on maternity leave, or the company's growing so quickly that they can't keep up with the hiring, and and they just need outside uh, help. Exactly, exactly, exactly yeah. those situations. And and how does localization, translation, and other language services fit into your portfolio? So, in what capacity have you worked with LSPs before? Well, example? I mean, it um, it fits into my portfolio because it's a service, and 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 my speciality and the speciality of uh, uh, Procurement Cube is procurement of services. Um, so, in 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 that mm -hmm. sense, that's a that's a perfect fit. On the buy side. Um, we've led a, a global um, multi-million translation sourcing project for a, a FTSE 100 company. Um, on the sales side, I'm currently working with a leading LSP on an on an is, initiative, excuse me, that aims at uh, educating procurement professionals about the translation industry and um, how value actually is added um, uh, within that space. Uh, when you source translation services. Yeah, you probably need a fair mm. amount of education on that side. And then we'll talk about later about sometimes the rotating function of it, but uh, let's touch on that in, in, in just a minute. So just give us a bit of a short intro around the procurement function in, in an organization more broadly and how it maybe differs for organizations of different sizes. I mean, I recall from my uh, days as kind of selling translation, it, like, you know, if once an organization hits a certain size, um, uh, procurement gets involved, but then it becomes extremely uh, structured and professional the larger the organization goes, right? But just tell us a bit from your experience, how uh, just introduction to the procurement function generally. Okay. Well, um, broadly speaking, the, the purpose, the whole purpose of a procurement function is to ensure that the organization receives as much relevant business value as, as it can in exchange for its, uh, its external spend. Uh, and to, to achieve that, the function has gone through quite a transition, uh, uh, over time. So, so it's, 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 it's an evolution. I would say a slow evolution from being, uh, tactical, transactional, to now becoming more strategic, which is also probably also why um, uh, language service providers bump up against them mm. more and more. Um, the picture, though, is very patchy in terms of how far companies have gone on that journey from being transactional to becoming strategic. So, so it's 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 really a patchwork, um, and. Um, to some extent, that's related to the size of the organization. Typically, the bigger the organization is, the more they have inve invested in making procurement strategic. But it doesn't always follow them. You can have very transactional teams in, in, in very big companies. And um, you may even see different, um, uh, different procurement teams within the same company uh, being at different points in that journey towards Becoming strategic, and and the probably the best example of that is a manufacturing company. They tend to have very sophisticated um, supply chain management teams, uh, direct procurement teams. So that's the teams that focus on anything that goes into the production. Whereas on the indirect part, so all the other overheads, like for example uh, translation services, there they are much less sophisticated. So it's 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 just a patchy picture. Uh, 
Uh, but what procurement ultimately wants to achieve is to be perceived as a um, strategic business partner of key stakeholders. Um, but um, I think most people in procurement would agree with me that 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 most teams are not are not at that stage yet. But that's that's where they want to get to. So that's sort of a a, a brief introduction to um, the whole. Uh, Where does it okay. report into what what uh, CFO typically or COO or kind of patchwork? Yeah, that's that's a good question. I mean, traditionally, the function has has reported into into the finance area. Um, we are seeing more and more now procurement being re- uh, represented at board level, so it's, 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 it 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 becomes its own area in its own right, uh, um, particularly. The large multinational companies, I think most, if not all of them now have CPOs, mm-hmm. chief procurement officers. Some of them, though, mm-hmm. reporting, still in report into, into finance, but some of them actually are directly represent, represented. At board if you level. could pick one sector, just a quick follow up on that. If you could pick one or two sectors that are like most advanced in the way they procure, what would those be? If, if, if there's anything or, you know, I don't know, maybe manufacturing or some, Manufacturing on the direct side, definitely. Uh, and within that, the automotive industry has a reputation of having very uh, well-developed procurement yeah. functions. Um, having been in pharma myself, and, and, and that being sort of the most important area that I consult into, uh, is also very sophisticated uh, uh, within within their procurement practices. And just, sorry, one, one more on that. Sorry, <laughs> just one more on that. Uh, <laughs> I have Florence another, like, I have another, add another, uh, on, add another. <laughs> just to unpack the, uh, the the indirect and direct. So let's say a pharma company. Direct would be literally the raw materials, or only the raw materials, and then indirect would be anything other than that, or just the broad classification there. Because as you just mentioned, translation probably would in, be in the indirect part. Yeah, I mean, if you th- if you think of a um, um, if you think of an income statement. Um, then you know where it says uh, um, cost of goods sold. That would that would typically be be direct. So in the in in the pharma context, yes, you're right. So that would be sort of the active ingredients, for example, um, anything that sort of goes straight into the production. Whereas uh, the the indirects, I guess you could consider that uh, as as the overheads on the on the income on the income statement. So um, yeah, stuff that you can't necessarily apportion to to one unit of, 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 of product. Hmm. And then on the, on the services side, if you're working with, with vendors, what maybe are there any misconceptions that you've observed around how procurement and centralized procurement works at the larger enterprises? Like what, what do people think versus what is the reality? What I um, often hear um, vendors say is that procurement only cares about price. And if you just lost, lost an RFP, that, that's what it looks like. That's what it feels like. So I, I can yeah. certainly understand that, um, that sentiment. But um, what procurement generally cares about is, is not price, it's lowering total costs. So, um, uh, you, you know, they, they also care about minimizing risk, for example. And... Um, and giving stakeholders the level of quality that they need rather than the level that they necessarily want. So there's that often that tension that between stakeholder and, and procurement about what is the right level of quality. So those are, so, so, so those are the things they care about uh, rather than caring about price directly. There is one caveat though, which I think applies very much when it comes to, to translation services. And that is if procurement doesn't know any better, then they will only care about price. So, for example, if they truly believe that translation services is a commodity, well, then it is. It is then it is only the price that matters. Now, of course, we all know. I think anybody listens to li- listening to this uh, podcast would agree that, of course, uh, translation services is not a com- commodity, but it's often perceived like that uh, by by procurement professionals. Just let's let's dwell on on this one. So. On this point of being a commodity or not being a commodity, is this 
would you say most procurement professionals would go into if they're like naive to the space to the, the language space they they go in thinking well translation 10 cents a word 15 cents a word it's a commodity or or is it almost like on a person by person basis that some of them are a little more open to thinking about things generally as less of a commodity and uh, in the services space just trying to get a feel for how much education is typically needed for somebody new to buying language services from the procurement side to kind of appreciating some of the nuances of it? Um, I think unless the procurement person had sort of takes a special interest in it, almost a personal interest in it, um, uh, it looks so much like a commodity that it's, 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 it's a bit of a challenge to get your head around that it's not because, because as you mentioned, um, so you have this standardized per, per word rate, and then you have tens of thousands of suppliers. Hmm. That looks like a commoditized market. Um, but uh, so I think I think that's a challenge here for LSPs to really to really uh, help educate procurement professionals because um, the extent to which most are willing to educate themselves about that is 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 not that great because um, you have to remember that. Translation services is typically a subcategory of a category, even a sub subcategory. <laughs> so uh, the amount of time that you can actually devote, you can justify devoting to really getting to understand this area, may be limited. It may it may not be in in, in some cases, but uh, that's a risk there. So I I I think I think that's a real education challenge, and I think it's it's, it's a substantial one. Yeah. Well, it's interesting you're talking about sub sub categories sub categories i mean let's unpack the the concept of um category management a little bit what what is it exactly and why does it matter for service vendors well the whole purpose of category management is to engage with supply market in a more strategic way so um to get more of that relevant business value that i was talking about um that i was talking about earlier in exchange for your in exchange for your uh, external spend um, what happens in the beginning when category management is rolled out in an organization is that all the external, external spend is, um, is grouped into categories, hence the name category management. Uh, and ideally these categories should match supply markets. So, so the type of suppliers that sell the same type of service and product should ideally be within the same category. And then um, a, a strategy, uh, which uh, is led, uh, the development of a strategy is, 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 is then carried out. That's led by the category manager with the involvement of a wider category team that also includes uh, business stakeholders. And I guess that's sort of the, I wouldn't say new thing about, about it because this has been going on for 20 years, right? Uh, but but uh, that's what makes it special, I guess. It's not. It's. It's no longer just a procurement thing. It's a it's supposed to be a no. business thing. Mm. Um, the reason why I think service providers would benefit from from knowing uh, about category management is that if they know which category their services fall into, then they also know which category manager to to influence, mm -hmm. um, and they also know. Um, uh, or they will be able to explore if there are ways that they can help optimize that category and then put that forward as a value proposition to the relevant. So category. let let me ask you something which has been on my mind for literally ten years. So when I when I was selling um, into the, into you know pharma banks etc., I did come across a bunch of um, categories and category management. Um, I don't know managers for lack of a better word, um, and sometimes they rotate it. Or I, at least I thought they were rotating. And then I kind of just in my mind thought, well, they're being rotated so I can't develop a personal relationship with them. But that may actually be wrong. I actually never kind of yeah. looked this up. Is that the case? Like are they, they're being rotated intentionally every two years so like vendors can't develop personal relationships long term? Um, your observation that they are uh, rotating is correct. Uh, the reason why they're rotating uh, may be less clear. Uh, so it's not to confuse vendors or prevent them from building a, uh, a long-term relationship. It's part of career development, really, within procurement. So um, it, typically, a category manager 
will seek to move into a category with a larger spend mm. after two, three years, uh, as you observe, because there's more mm. prestige associated with bigger categories. However, some of them, uh, if they don't have that opportunity, they, they will then try to make a lateral move into a different category of a similar value. Um, because in order to actually move ahead within the procurement profession in a global multinational company, you need to have that breadth of procurement experience. Without that, you can't become head of procurement, for example. So that's why you see this. Uh, it, m- it might look like musical chairs, I guess, from the vendor side, but but that yeah. So you did answer my question because I, I I was like I remember a couple of relationships with with uh, category managers that went really well, and I felt like okay, I've established report, and definitely I'm going to be invited back when the next big RFP comes around. And then, whoops, they were gone. And then I'm like, oh, no, now there's this new person. And talking about the educational yeah. part, it's like literally that new person had no idea what translation was, came in, commodity, and it was the whole kind of uh, song and dance again. So, Yeah. So the, it, I think it just underscores that this this education yeah. piece is a continual, continual thing, really, mm. uh, to invest in. Yeah. Well, and you'd think that they, if they, if the category managers are staying in the same organization, that there's a benefit to actually passing on that knowledge to whoever's taking um, over your category. Yeah. Th- there's a lot of stuff to, pa- to pass on. Yeah. And if translation services is a sub sub category, <laughs> it could easily be forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. So for LSPs then, I mean, what do you think is, do you have any tips or what do you think is the best way um, for LSPs to actually make contact with and be able to pitch um, procurement departments that are operating centrally? That's a very good question. Um, I think the first thing that you need to do is to take a step back and really ask yourself, should I pitch to procurement? Mm -hmm. Does it make sense to pitch to procurement? If your unique selling points are aligned with the procurement agenda, then it makes perfect sense to pitch to procurement. But if they're not, then I think you're better off pitching to a stakeholder, a key stakeholder that really, really cares about those uh, unique selling points. Um, and, you know, just to give some examples of what's on procurement's agenda in general, I think no matter what company you're talking about and what size, um, spend consolidation. Um, procurement will always attempt to reduce the number of suppliers and consolidate the spend because that's one of the key problems. Actually, when companies first discover that they need somebody looking after procurement, or small companies growing, it's because they they discover that, oh, all of a sudden we have, uh, we're a small company, we've got thousands of suppliers, that something needs to happen. And and that challenge continues as the company grows. So that's always this this, this drive to, 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 to consolidate the supply base. So if you have a service offering that in some way, shape or form can help with that, then that's a good pitch to procurement. Hmm. Um, if, um, you have something that can reduce risk because procurement cares about, um, risk as well, that could be a good, good pitch to procurement as well. And the more, I would say, verifiable, um, social proof you have to back up your claims, uh, you know, the better that pitch will go to procurement because they, they tend to be very sort of, uh, uh, uh data driven and data focused. Mm-hmm. Um, in terms of who to pitch to, in procurement, um, there you need to find out who's responsible for the for the translation spend. Uh, obviously, that, if, if you don't know that, you know that that can be quite tricky because it falls within different categories and within within different large companies. Mm-hmm. Um, I would probably, uh, if I was selling translation services into procurement, I would look for somebody with the title of procurement manager for indirects. But not all procurement teams are structured in a way so there is somebody with that title. And if, so if not, then I would go for somebody who uh, has who a category manager responsible for corporate services or even marketing. Mm-hmm. So it's that you know, it's a little bit trial and error to find out who to talk to there, and it, it requires quite some LinkedIn research. I mm. think. Well, and, and you said as you were talking just then about consolidation of well, services, and then also consolidation presumably of the of the vendor side the list of the pool of vendors um, I mean do you have a take on 
the idea of a multi-vendor strategy versus single vendor strategies uh, within language services and translation in particular. Um, have you seen any particular trends or shifts around attitudes to those vendor strategies? Hmm. Um, the trend that I see, so, so I'm linked to uh, the previous question, uh, my answer to the previous question is that when pre procurement gets involved, it, it, it becomes single, mm. single, vendor, single vendor strategy. Uh, I think from a procurement point of view, uh, for those reasons that I mentioned, a, a multi-vendor strategy does not work particularly well. Um, uh, so um, when you have a multi-vendor strategy, I think it's often because uh, procurement has not, it, it, that spend area has not yet caught procurement's eye, right? They have not yet taken an interest in it. And so therefore a multi-vendor strategy has, has been allowed to evolve organically. Um, now, uh, stakeholders may very, very much want a multi-vendor mm. uh, strategy for their own, because of their own preferences. But, um, procurement will always try to pull in the other direction. The, the only exception that I can think of is, where procurement wants to appoint a uh, master vendor that then so that the con the, the company contracts with that one translation agency that who, uh, and and then the other um, many vendors then contract with that with that master vendor um that kind of hides the problem of having too many suppliers uh so there are and a lot of challenges with that model from a procurement point of view but that's the only sort of scenario where I can see where procurement would actually favor a multi-vendor strategy. They would, they would, they, they would go for single or um, mm. few. I mean, rather than having hundred and fifty. Yeah. So let, let's stick with the know, two and two three, three for a second. So right. it, would it ever be a risk consideration? Let's say some of the very big tech companies, right? Or maybe in pharma companies, they say, well, okay, we we got twenty million dollar, thirty million dollar localization translation spend. We, we don't want to give everything to one single vendor. We want to kind of have another uh, company that's also very familiar with, with our account and understands this just in case, I don't know, for risk purposes or de-risking it a little bit and also keeping the, the major vendor on their toes in terms of pricing and that there's always kind of somebody breathing down their neck. Is that the reality or not, not so much? Yes, it is. I mean, that, yeah, that, that is a, a common procurement strategy. Um, it would particularly be applied by, um, category managers who have realized that we're not talking about a commodity. There is actually a supply risk here. You know, uh, uh, if, if, if you see the market as perfectly commoditized, then there's really no risk. I mean, you, you can, you should be able to chop and change whenever you need. If you realize that that's not the case, that strategy you mentioned, perfectly uh, makes perfectly sense and 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 that's one I'll implement myself as well. And you mentioned something that you were working on at, at the moment was uh, with around an education piece helping an LSP I think educate um uh we'll talk to procurement. Um what do you think that LSPs can do? I mean to what extent is it really possible for LSPs to help and educate procurement procurement departments? I mean is it things like oh we'll help you write the RFP uh, and what what are some of the things that you know you can you at Procurement Cube can also assist with? I would not recommend uh, directly offering to help write the, mm. the RFP because that's uh, that's going to receive some pushback uh, and be perceived as trying to unduly mm -hmm. uh, influence. And so the whole concept of fairness uh, is, is is very strong within uh, within the procurement profession. Um, but what I think LSPs can do is to, to educate procurement about, um, um, how they can actually get value out of the translation spend. I mean, you, the, if, if, if you have a discussion about quality versus price, you know, what does that quality give you in terms of ability to reduce overall costs? What does it give you in, 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 in the ability to, to, to mitigate risk of having a botched mm -hmm. translation and, you know, things like that? Um, in terms of what procurement cube can do, uh, in that space is that procurement cube can, can act as the independent voice within that whole education piece. Um, I think within procurement, there is a healthy skepticism towards vendors that try to, to help. You know, are they, 
are they helping themselves sell? Yeah. Are, you know, are, it, it, are they really helping or, you know, it, uh, so, you know, that can put, um, that, that, you know, that can give some objectivity to, to, to the whole education piece uh, by working with. Uh, so let's a, uh, do a little bit of crystal boxes. ball or maybe not so much since you're the expert. I mean, are there some trends in procurement like that? LSPs should be aware of anything, any kind of bigger shifts. And I don't know, maybe the pandemic has had some impact on procurement as well. I don't know. Just like what are the next two, five years going to bring and, and how, what, what should LSPs be aware of generally? I think the future of procurement is going to, it's going to look like more of the same. So, um, you know, they, they, they have been on this journey that I talked about for, for a couple of decades now, I would say. That's going to continue. So more representation at board level, more um, getting closer to the internal um, uh, customers, to the to the stakeholders, um, becoming more and more strategic, uh, uh, trying to influence more pockets of spend around the company. That's another thing. That's another thing that's high on the procurement's agenda, influencing as much of the spend as they can. So when I guess when procurement was in its infancy. You know, they they would be looking after this much of the total spend now it's like this and you know they they want to continue pushing the boundaries on that um in terms of what the pandemic has done in terms of uh, when it comes to perhaps um uh, reorienting procurement a bit uh it, well in some sense it's brought it's brought them back to basics because because uh now in the whole recovery after after the pandemic it's it's put more focus on cost management, hmm. which has always been sort of, you know, procurement's big thing, but, but even more focus on it now, even more focus on supplier risk management because the pandemic exposed the risks sure. that there were in the supply chain, which nobody paid any attention to before, really. And linked to that, um, and this is actually a change, um, there is now more focus on developing flexible supply chains before the pandemic, um, uh, procurement or, uh, organizations in general did the exact opposite. They were pursuing just-in-time systems, which are not flexible. But then, of course, when something as dramatic as the pandemic hits, then just-in-time just doesn't it doesn't work. And you would have been more you would have been better off with perhaps a more expensive supply chain, but at least one that can cope with these kind of uh, mm. uh, upsets. Yeah, you're right. I read a lot about uh, containers costing like three times now, shipping from Shanghai to Rotterdam and like all of these chip chip shortages. And so, yeah, it must have been a, or still is yeah. an incredibly, uh, you know, challenging time for procurement. So, well, uh, Armand, where, where, do, where do people find you? Uh, where do people find Procurement Cube? Um, you can find Procurement Cube on uh, www.procurementcube.org. Um, which is our, our website. Um, where you can, uh, um, read our blog post as well. There's a, a section with uh, a number of blogs that uh, are of interest to, to procurement professionals and, uh, other business people alike. And connect to you on LinkedIn as we did. So, uh, <laughs> absolutely. Yes. And, and I would, I would like to mention here that, uh, um, I am extremely easy to find on LinkedIn because my my claim to fame is that I'm the only arm and Brevik yeah. on the entire LinkedIn. There you go. Good for you. Good for you. That's uh, there's some U USP right there. Um, all right. Thanks so much, Armand. That was a pleasure yeah, having so you much. here. Thanks. 